experienced a confusing sign? Have you looked at a sign and been like, what? Well, this is a sign from California, of course. Uh, it is a parking sign in Los Angeles. And uh, I, I don't know about you, but there's a good chance that I'm just going to keep going, right? Like, I'm going to look at that sign and be like, probably not. Probably not. Because, you know, it's not the winter solstice or, you know, I'm not wearing the right shoes or whatever else they are, you know, asking me to do. So that sign, right, is unclear because there's a lot of information and it is hard to know where you fit in, in that sign. But there are other signs where you might have to stop and like do a, a double take, not, not because they're complicated, but because you're maybe not the intended audience for the sign. You may not know this, but some of our friends to the north of us in Montgomery County have blown up local social media for their own confusing signs. You may have seen it the last couple weeks, and I am, of course, talking about the Great Conroe Sign War. It all started when everybody's favorite cafeteria, Luby's, yes, Luby's, put a message up on their marquee, poking fun at how early Walmart puts everything out, like decorations-wise, like, you know, we're doing, as soon as New Year's rolls around, it's like Valentine's, and so they say, come see our July 4th specials, we just want to beat Walmart to the punch. <laughs> then, probably for fun, a local bakery in town called Montgomery Bakehouse posted a reply, sort of upping the ante, and they said, hey, Luby's, come in for Halloween 2023 tw treats, and this was like this week. And then in sign four, uh, or sign three, they say, Luby's comes back and they say, Bakehouse has sugar and spice, but we got everything nice. So now there's like a little tit for tat coming. And then the next sign, Bakehouse says, hey, Luby's, Luann said she'd be our Valentine. So now, okay, Valentine's Day theme. And then, but, it keep, but it keeps going. Luby says, hey, Pedro's, uh-oh, new, new, new auntie, somebody else with a marquee. Hey, Pedro's, Bakehouse said they don't have to refry their food. So, ooh, yeah, now it's like some shade, saltiness. And then, and then the next one, Pedro says, hey, Bakehouse, they kind of stay above the fray. They're like, we're not going to talk to Luby's. They were mean. Hey, Bakehouse, we have margaritas, sugar and spice, and everything nice. So they're like, we up to Andy because you can have alcohol. And so then the, the next one, this is where, you know, the police have to get involved at this point. So they say, sign war in progress. I'm pretty sure those are two of, two of the restaurants. Okay. And then the next one, it says, Hey, Conroe PD, this is still Luby's. Pedro's and Bakehouse, our sign is bigger, like our portions. Oh. Well, yeah, I know. Luby is just, just getting after it. And then the next one, of course, out of nowhere, Dark Horse, Conroe High School. We joined the sign wars, but you'd all get schooled. Nice, <laughs> nice, nice pun. Yeah, the dad joke is strong over there. And then next, and finally, and the sign war plot chickens. Believe it or not, I actually had to stop here because this is still going on. There's been like 23 of these. So <laughs> what's funny about all of these uh, is you may see more showing up on your feed, but imagine seeing one of these signs and not knowing about that sequence, like that, that sign war. And you just walk in and, and it's like, hey, Luby, it's come for a Halloween 2023 treats on a bake shop that, you know, in downtown Conroe. You'd kind of be like, what, what? Why are they talking to Luby's and why are they mentioning Halloween? If you remove it from the context, all of a sudden the sign kind of loses its, its meaning. It certainly loses its, its, uh, its humor. And so it only exists in this sort of playful banter between all of these local bi businesses. But out of context, it's strange. It's confusing. And today in our text, we are going to see a sign like this. We've been moving through biblical eras and have just come out of the era of Noah and God's covenant with him. And really, God's covenant with all humanity through Noah, because Noah would give birth to all of the humanity subsequent to the flood. And so, we, we look at that, in this new era, we see something different. Out of context, God is going to make a covenant with a sign, a symbol, that is going to seem random or arbitrary because we're just sort of jumping into it. So it's going to be our job to sort of flesh out and talk about how that's not random or arbitrary or even maybe a bit kind of strange. But in the context of his promise and the relationship that he's beginning, the sign begins to make sense. 
And so each week, David uh, has kind of designed this pattern as we walk through this big picture series. This week, we are in covenant to Exodus. And each week, we ask a central question that we begin to answer with a specific text. But to kind of set the tone, we ask the question, what is the significance of this era in the big picture? So what is unique about the era that we're going to be in today compared to the previous three that we've discussed? is that this marks the beginning of God sort of broadening his divine sort of self-disclosure, making himself known in a more open way. He's starting something bigger. Up until now, God has obviously been steering major events in history, but he's been primarily dealing with individuals and their families. And he is personally interacting with relatively few people, really very, very few people. He, uh, we've got some names that we've seen over the last uh, uh, few chapters. We've got Adam, Cain, Abel, Noah, and we've got some stories. We've got the fall, we've got the flood, we've got the Tower of Babel, which we're sort of skipping because it's still taking place in that post-Noah flood era. It's not really a new era, but it's a new story in that era. But now, from a textual standpoint, we're going to get the most important person in the book of Genesis. That's the person of Abraham. So why is he the most important? Well, for one thing, up to this point, we've, we've sort of been blowing through these eras, haven't we? We're covering huge epics of time in just a couple of chapters. Adam's life really only gets a couple of chapters. We don't even really know how, how long he was in the garden or anything like that before he started aging because of the fall, but huge swaths of time. And then, same with Noah, we get like three and a half chapters with his story. It's a big story. It includes the destruction of all humanity and the, kind of the reboot, reset of, of the moral life of, of God's people and really life as we know it because of the flood. But at Genesis 12, we meet Abraham, or Abram as he's called at that time, and the narrative really begins to slow down. It slows down a lot. It gets more detailed. And we hang with him for the next 13 chapters, comparatively a long time between all the other patriarchs that we've seen so far. And then, after those 13 chapters, we hang with his direct descendants through the end of the book. So again, Abraham, the whole story sort of opens up. So right at the start of this era, we encounter more characters, we witness more interactions, and we start to see more of a scope and sequence to Abraham's life. We're not just talking about kind of like one event, build an ark, survive the flood, you know, plant a vineyard, okay, the end of the story. We, we have much more going on with Abraham. Not counting ge- genealogies, in Noah's story, we have no named characters other than his sons. And the subsequent story of that era, the Tower of Babel, has no named characters. Everybody's nameless in that story. It's just a society, it's a culture, but we don't get any, any main characters in that story. But here, in the time spent with Abraham, we don't just get main characters, we get names of family members, we get names uh, of people like his nephew Lot, we get Abimelech, even a pharaoh of Egypt, and you may even remember from our time in the book of Hebrews, studying together, the king of Salem, the priest Melchizedek. And that's just to name a few, there are many, many more. We have these big stories, these big characters, kind of in rapid succession, one after the other, because we're getting more detailed. And like the previous stories we get in Genesis up to this point, we meet a man who calls on the name of the Lord, Abraham. And like with Noah, God deals personally with Abram at the start of this. And also like Noah, he gives him a task that requires faith. So this isn't our text, but I just want to jump into Abram's introduction just briefly. This is Genesis 12. Our text is going to be in 17. This is Genesis 12, 1 through 3. It says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So this is the beginning of the call of Abram. The land that God shows him, of course, is the land of Canaan, which is the region that will one day become the nation of Israel. So this is all tremendous 
foreshadowing for things to come even next week and in later weeks, Lord willing. And it is important to remember that up to this point, God has allowed sort of tribes and nations to rise up and prosper in spite of their wickedness and only directly intervened at the flood where he sort of wipes the slate clean, which we already talked about, and then kind of again at Babel in Genesis 11. And we saw that wickedness in Noah's day was, was what caused God to flood the earth. And at Babel, which we didn't cover, we get a different reason and outcome uh, that has bearing on how God deals with Abraham. So look back with me briefly at Babel in Genesis 11.4, just one verse. So this is the, the, the people of Babel, they say. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. So Babel had arrogantly tried to make a great name for themselves. And that obviously doesn't go very well for them, if you know the story. Uh, but God uh, says, no, you will not make a great name for yourself. And he topples the tower and scatters the people and confuses their language. But God, in calling upon Abram, is going to graciously and generously bestow a great name onto the man Abram. Not because he did anything. He didn't build a tower. He hasn't done anything. We just meet him and God starts going, hey, I'm going to do this for you. Just one guy called Abram, one of the descendants of all these scattered peoples. Right? He's just he's living in a place and God speaks to him. But this this new pace that we're kind of talking about and all this detail is because this is the moment where we really start to see God building toward something. Through this family, God is going to build a people. And one day, those people will become a nation. So, why is this era significant? This era is significant because it is here that God begins a powerful covenant relationship with a family that will one day bring about his kingdom. And while this era has many direct dealings between God and Abraham, today's central text comes from God's reaffirmation of his covenant with Abraham. So if you have a Bible, I'd love for you to get it out. We're going to be in Genesis 17. 1 through 14. That's our central text. It's also going to be on the screen. Speaking of being a dad. All right. So I'll read the text in its entirety, and then we'll, we'll sort of look at it together. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations and kings shall come out of you, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. 
so shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. May God bless today the reading and the hearing of his holy word. So this is our main text today. And in uh, this covenant between God and Abram, we are going uh, to see the beginning of something great. But before we get too deep in looking at this, it's good to remember that, that God has actually already told Abram much of this. So what we're about to discuss is actually the reaffirmation of the covenant found just two chapters earlier in Genesis chapter 15, but with some important new dimensions. And we're not going to look at both texts today. We're going we're to focus on, on this text, but, but it's, it's going to be important to, to know that some time has passed. We're going to talk about how much in a second between Genesis 15 and the reaffirmation of that covenant in in Genesis 17. So it says, When Abraham, this is verse 1 and 2, When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty, walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. So it says Abraham is 99 years old, and that gives us a clue to how long it has been because the original covenant was when he was 86 years old. So 13 years has passed. Sarai, in Genesis 15, Abram's wife, at the time Sarai, now Sarah, uh, had still not conceived a son in those 13 years. That is what has happened. And in their impatience, Abram has fathered a son with Sarai's servant, Hagar, named Ishmael. And at this point, Abram has got to be wondering, How is this covenant going to be fulfilled? God has said something is going to happen. 13 years have gone by. They've sort of taken matters into their own hands a little bit, trying to make God's will happen for themselves. And the scriptures, other other than at the very beginning of that, where it's already not looking great, there's already jealousy between Hagar and Sarai, we don't get a lot about what happens in those 13 years. We get that story in chapter 16, and then it says basically 13 years later. So, Probably not good. We can assume that there has still been that contending with jealousy between Abram's wife and his concubine, Hagar, and an unanswered promise of God for 13 years. So a reaffirmation of this covenant, this promise, is not entirely out of left field for God, but it is, of course, still a very gracious thing to do that God did not have to do, but he does do for Abram. So The Lord appears to him and identifies himself with a name. It says, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Now, we look at God Almighty, and we don't necessarily think of that as a name. We just say it's like kind of like a title or an adjective to describe who God is. But that's the Hebrew word, El Shaddai. Evan Painter, we should uh, should have done that Amy Grant song. I forgot to say that. El Shaddai. That would have been good. Uh, But this is El Shaddai. This is how God announces himself To Abraham, we think that means God Almighty. It's actually kind of hard to know what that truly means, but traditionally that is how it is translated. That's how it's translated here. And so the idea of an all-powerful God is is probably what is at the root of that Hebrew word Shaddai. El means God. And so this is God's name for himself that he announces. And this is the first time that it shows up in Scripture. Scripture. This divine name appears only 48 times in the Old Testament, most often in Job, where Job is talking to God Almighty, who's in charge of his life, right? So this is a, this is a very specific name, and it, it implies God's tremendous sovereignty over all things. This, uh, we, we don't know the manner of this appearing, right? It just says that God appears to him. How he appears, what he looks like, we're, we're not told. But the Lord somehow physically manifests himself to Abram. Now, previously in 15, it says he has a vision of the Lord, probably a little different. This time it just says he appears. So slightly different wording. And these instances of God revealing himself physically, whether taking the shape of a man or a burning bush or a pillar of cloud, those are all called theophanies. That's the theological term for it. So God shows up 
in a physical manifestation, a theophany. And when those happen, just pro tip, usually something big is happening with God when he shows up like that. And while the Lord, that word that we often see, a lot of times we may skip past it and not notice it because you know, our eyes do that. But anytime you see Lord, all caps, right, in your Bible, the Lord, like that, and usually like small caps, that's the Yahweh, right? That's the Y-H-W-H, tetragrammaton, it's called. Now, that word has not been revealed either yet. It's used a lot in Genesis, but God has not called himself that to anyone. And as he reveals himself to Abram, he doesn't call himself that. He calls him God Almighty. I am God Almighty, not the I am Yahweh. That comes later. Stay tuned. But we have this, this call from God Almighty. He appears and he says to Abraham, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. So there's a distinctive verbal form in the Hebrew here, used to underline the ongoing nature of this walk, of this walking and this being blameless. So it's sort of continue in. Continue in walking before me and continue to be blameless. That's sort of the ongoing nature of the tense that's there. And uh, the same root here is, is used back a ways in chapter 6, verse 9, to describe Noah, but it's not in a continuing sense. It just says Noah was blameless before God. Here, Abraham is giving him a call. He's saying, walk before me. And be this, be blameless before me. Why? Why walk before God blameless? That I may make a great my covenant between you and me and may multiply you greatly. So this, the idea of covenant is central to this chapter. The word occurs 13 times across nine verses. So covenant is why we're saying from covenant to Exodus. We are talking about this important new covenant in this new era of God's dealing with us as humanity. And so this covenant has promises associated with God's blessing, but also we notice his holiness. He is calling Abram to walk blameless, and then he will make his covenant. He says, that I may make my covenant between you. So he, he gives him a command and he says, so that, that I may make my covenant with you. So God's command is a means. God's command to walk blameless is a means to his covenant end. There's a conditional element to this covenant, and it starts with Abram walking blamelessly before God. If he does that, then God will multiply him abundantly. So in verse 3, Abram responds, I would say, appropriately, by falling on his face. Now, you could say, well, maybe he's just falling on his face because the Lord has appeared to him. But I think if that were true, that would have happened immediately. Verse 3 would have had to follow immediately after the first part of verse 1, but it doesn't. So it must be a combination of that theophany of God showing up and appearing and the divine word of direction, directive and promise that follows to produce this awe in Abraham. Walk before me blameless that I might make my covenant between me and you. Only then does Abraham fall face down. And while he's face down, God keeps speaking. So behold, this is verse 4 and 5, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. Notice that tense change. I have made you the father of, multiple, uh, of a multitude of nations. So the transformation of Abram's name to Abraham encapsulates the purpose of this new covenant. In, in Hebrew, Abram means exalted father. It already sounds pretty good. Going to be a father of nations, but Abraham means father of multitude. So now we may wonder why the Lord says father of a multitude of nations, because at first he's like, I'm going to make you great, I'm going to make you into a nation, and then he says, I'm going to make you a father of a multitude of nations, because we always sort of think of, he's the patriarch, he's the patriarch of Israel, he's the father of that great nation. Why here does God say he is the father of 
a multitude of nations. Well, there, there's, a, there's a couple ways you could look at it. One, he also is the father of Ishmael. Ishmael goes on to make different nations, so there's that. There's just a very normal reading of that. But also, the term father, while it does normally denote a biological relationship, there's my father right there, John Godbold. Hey, Pa. He was at Daddy Daughter too last night, cutting a rug on YMCA. I have the video to prove it. So Joseph also kind of describes himself as a father to Pharaoh. There are ways in which this word can become metaphorically. In Judges, in a really messed up story in Judges, there's a priest, kind of priest, Levite named Micah, who is taken, and he's young, he's taken into an older man's house, and he says, that you might be a father to me. So there are other ways that the Bible uses the term father. Obviously, Abraham is a father in the biological and conventional Seth, and that is at sense, and that is at the center of this promise, this covenant. But there is also that earlier divine promise from Genesis 12 that says, in you, all the families of earth shall be blessed. In you, all the families of earth shall be blessed. So all the nations obviously includes all the families. So he is a father of multitude, of a multitude of nations. As a father figure, Abraham will have a profound influence on others including those who are not his biological children. So that's kind of the big picture as to why that exists, that that title, father of a multitude of nations, because in Abraham, a multitude of, of nations will be blessed in God's big story that he's telling. So the Lord continues in six. He says, I will make you exceedingly fruitful. And I will make you into nations, and kings shall come out of you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. So look at all the things that God says he's going to do. He says he's going to make him exceedingly fruitful. That would be wealth, material wealth, exceedingly fruitful. And if we follow Abraham's story, that is exactly what happens. This dude gets rich, rich in land, rich in livestock, rich in worldly possessions, and then rich in God's blessing, God's actual spiritual blessing because of this covenant. God continues to go before him to be faithful, even when Abraham isn't, clearly. He's coming in here after Abraham has already sort of gone, "Mm, maybe with this concubine is what God meant. But he's like, no, I'm going to be faithful to you. I am going to make you fruitful. I'm going to make you into nations. That's a restatement of something he's already said. He says, kings will come out of you. So again, same idea. Nations, the nation of Israel, of course, is it going to eventually have kings? So that's Very easy to draw that line. The covenant will continue, it says, into future generations because it is an everlasting covenant. It says he will give you and your descendants a place, a land. That's the land of Canaan where he has been sojourning. Sojourning means traveling around, settling for a bit, moving around, settling for a bit. That's where he's been. And he says, most importantly, of Abram, and his descendants, I will be their God. So, in all these things, God is graciously offering Abram, now Abraham, wealth, prosperity, a continued family line, and most importantly, a relationship for all time where God will be the God of Abraham's family and their descendants. This is a much, much more significant change in God's dealings with people than we have seen so far. This covenant is different. On the one hand, right, it's, it's sort of much more sweeping in its effects to the intended person that it's being given to. But on the other hand, it's, it's a narrower application, right? So unlike the Lord's covenant with Noah, which is universal, it's like every living creature, it says in in chapter 9, God's covenant with Abraham is ultimately restricted 
to a particular branch of a particular man's descendants. So it's not even Ishmael that's getting this. It's going to be Isaac who gets this. So not even all of Abraham's family receives this covenant the same way. Think about other people in Abraham's orbit. We've got Ishmael, we've got Lot, we've got Eleazar, who he wants to name his heir in Genesis 15. And these would-be heirs and close relatives are not going to receive this covenant blessing. God has said, no, I'm doing it this way, through your wife. This is how it will happen. And the Lord is doing a new thing by carving out this particular line. And in 9 through 11, it says, And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you, throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. So now we have this sort of new conditional part of this covenant. In, in chapter 15, there was no sign of the covenant like this. So in this reaffirmation of this same covenant to bless Abram, to make him a multitude of nations, he's now changed his name to Abraham, and he has added this new section, this new sign. And this is a conditional part of the covenant. This requires his participation. While we already knew that God wanted Abraham to walk blameless before the Lord, that's pretty conditional too, there is now this new fun thing he gets to do uh, to show his obedience, and that is this sign of the covenant. And I got to wonder here if Abraham was like, I don't know. Uh, can I just like cut my hair or shave my head, something? And, and one thing I, I learned during the preparation for this message that I really I did not know is that circumcision was actually not uniquely practiced among Hebrews. Uh, there is, uh, uh, among ancient Egyptians, uh, evidence that they did it as a puberty rite um, and that it was practiced among other Semitic peoples of the ancient Near East, but not universally so, clearly. So then why this sign, you might wonder? Did, did God originate it, and then these other people sort of picked it up as like this cool thing to do? It seems unlikely. Um, but you never know. Ancient world is a different place. But it's, it's not especially visible of a sign. It's not going to be something everybody sees. And so think back to our sign analogy. We start to go, what? why? What is this sign? What is, what is it for? Why are you symbolizing your covenant with this thing? that you're asking me to do. Um, that probably would have been what I asked. And so, as signs go, you know, it's kind of, kind of private. Uh, Kaylee, our, our keyboard uh, uh, player extraordinaire, and more importantly, uh, our amazing communications assistant, has been doing these awesome little graphics, these little, um, you, you may have seen them in our, in our background. She gives kind of like an icon for each era, and I was like, man, what is she gonna do for this one? This is, you know, this needs to be an all ages thing. So like, what are, what are we, what are we going to do? And so she came up with a fire and I was like, well, I don't really know how that connects. It's not like a flint knife or something else. But, but in Genesis 15, there's a lot of fire in that covenant. There's a flaming pot and this torch that passes between them. And so we went with, for that one, for that side, rather than, rather than this. Because this is a, this is a, you know, sensitive, no pun intended, thing to talk about. To, to describe, and to the world at large, it seems confusing and strange that this would be the thing, the sign. But if the first part of our text is about prosperity and blessing that Abraham will experience, the second part is clearly about his household and future offspring and how they are to obediently participate in it. And the sign of obedience is circumcision. But why? Let's keep reading. This is verse 12 and 13. It says, He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall be surely circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh. An everlasting covenant. 
So why is the sign this? Well, the sign actually sort of matches up with the covenant blessings, doesn't it? It's a continuing sign. Every male eight days old throughout your generations. So it continues like the covenant does. This is going to be repeated just like the blessing. It's a unifying sign. It says, whether born in your house or bought with your money. So over the centuries, the fact that every male, every Hebrew or Israelite male was to be circumcised had a leveling effect within the spiritual community. Whether wealthy or poor, master or servant, all shared a common experience and a common mark before their God. All were equal in stature before him. It's also a lasting sign. God makes that clear. He says, I'm going to create in your flesh an everlasting covenant. The sign was permanent. All followers of El Shaddai would be required to have this lasting sign. And lastly, and this is the one that I think we struggle with the most. It's an appropriate sign. Here's what I mean. Since this covenant has to do with offspring, we have to understand this sign is related quite clearly to the act of procreation itself. One commentator remarked that circumcision is a surrender of the first portion of the bodily member used to fulfill God's command to humanity to be fruitful and multiply. So, for Abraham, remember, nearly a hundred years old, he's lived a lot of life one way, but nearly a hundred years old, he lives with a barren wife. And I think the idea of doing this now, after God says, I will give you a son, well, it's fair to say that it clearly symbolized the willingness of a man to submit all of himself to God and to all of his covenant commands. So we begin to see, unlike the rainbow, the bow we talked about in the covenant of Noah, the sign of circumcision was not just a reminder to God. Remember, David so wonderfully put, the, the rainbow was a reminder to God more than it was a reminder to us. It was a sign for him. So how do we relate this sign it's above all a sign of an obedient heart toward God. And 14 reminds us of that. It says, any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So this sign of God's covenant was not optional. This, one, uh, this is one of the reasons why... Uh, we know that God has a sense of humor. The consequences for disobedient are that the uncircumcised is cut off from his kinsmen. Most scholars agree that this consequence clearly involves some Hebrew word play here. Um, he that is not cut will be cut off. God is saying, here's the choice, be cut or be cut off. But now I think it can be confusing as a bit of scripture to read so far down the road from these events where we are in the story versus where this is. It can be tough to talk about being cut off from God's people for being uncircumcised or read that this is an everlasting sign, an everlasting covenant since circumcision ceased to be required uh, as a practice for Christians. Indeed, there are now many cultures where worshipers of the same God of Abraham, El Shaddai, have not been circumcised. But this was true even in the early church. Paul wrote a letter about it. It's called Galatians. It's great. And the early church held a huge council about it in Acts 15 because it was so intertwined with the identity of the people of God. And so before we get to our application today, we, we got to deal with that. We got to deal with this issue, this everlasting covenant. How, how does this work now? And so one important word that can't be overlooked is sign. Circumcision was a sign of the covenant, not the essence of the covenant. The covenant depended ultimately on the spiritual allegiance of the parties because before we even get there, God says, walk before me and be blameless. This spiritual dimension was inherent in the covenant as the expulsion of certain uh, uh, circumcised 
but otherwise disqualified members in Abraham, uh, Abraham's household later will show. So you can be circumcised and still miss out on the covenant, right? The sign doesn't guarantee you anything because the sign isn't the covenant. It's a sign. So uh, we also uh, know that those who enjoy the favor of the Lord later in Deuteronomy will be called to have circumcised hearts. Hence, the eternal nature of the covenant describes the spiritual regeneration of a believer. The sign is obedience. Circumcision of the heart implies a total devotion to God. But the uncircumcised ear cannot hear so as to respond to the Lord. We hear that in Jeremiah. The uncircumcised lips cannot speak. We hear that in Exodus 6. The idea that circumcision was just an external sign That's not true. For the Jewish people, circumcision always carried a spiritual dimension to it. It was an external sign of an internal devotion to God Almighty. Uh, One commentator I read that I I found helpful, he said, uh, this is Alan uh, Bevere, he said, a fine distinction between inward and outward cannot be maintained in Judaism. Those who are the people of God must live as the people of God. I would argue that that's true for Christians as well. So that sort of brings us to our application this morning. There's a lot here. I wish we could spend more time with it, but I want, I want everybody to understand. It can be really easy to summarize this passage something like this. But God shows up. He changes a dude's name, tells him he's going to bless him, gives him his heart's desire. But he says, you know, he has to, you know, alter his anatomy and then go do that to every male in his house. And you just kind of go, okay, what are we supposed to make of that? That can be the way that we would approach a story like this. It just sort of feels very distant to us. It doesn't necessarily connect. And when we put it that way, of course it does. Yeah, it, it feels really different than how things might go in 2023. Christianity, New Testament believers. But what if we phrase it like this? God graciously invites someone who doesn't deserve it into fellowship with him. And he calls him towards obedience and purity. And he calls him to distinguish himself from those around him, even in the most intimate places that others can't see. That's sort of just the gospel, isn't it? And we know Abraham isn't perfect. That's not why God picks him. He's just a guy. Just like you, just like me. He's flawed. He's scared. He's called to do things he can't possibly do on his own. But he also believes God. And that belief is credited to him as righteousness. And so God says, walk before me, blameless. And that is our application this morning too. Walk before God and be blameless. So that first part sounds easier. (laughs) You can walk before God. I know, we can't be blameless. Neither could Abraham. Neither was Abraham. We've got pretty great evidence that he was not. But Abraham could and did believe. He could say yes to the next thing that God asked him to do, even if it didn't make any sense to the watching world. We're called into things by God that we can't possibly do for ourselves. The good news that Abraham couldn't fully comprehend at this stage in God's story of redemption, is that God would do for us that which we could never do for ourselves. To walk before a holy God and be blameless takes one who has done it, and that person is Jesus. So to have circumcised hearts and eyes and ears for us today requires the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So if you are a believer, know what God requires of you. He requires you to live a life that is distinct from the world. He requires you to live a life of obedience to his way. But like Abraham, first he requires your heart, your trust, your faith. Galatians, the book we talked about, deals with this stuff. Galatians 3, 6 through 9 says this. It says, just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, Know then that this, that it, that 
it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles, that would be us, by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Abraham was full of faith because he knew a faithful God. Another thing that we all have in common with him. Another thing we sing about. But we get the benefit of being much further in the story than he was. We have a much better view of the big picture. So as we walk before God, church, may we walk by faith and live lives of obedience distinct from the world. Because as, as Mitch read in our scripture reading in 1 Thessalonians, it is how we ought to walk. We walk to please God, it said. And in so doing, we live properly before outsiders. We will be distinct from the world if we live this way. Distinct in kindness, in compassion, charity, love, integrity. As Christians, we should be emblematic of those things because they are ours in Christ Jesus and should be increasing, the Apostle Peter tells us. So, the question for each of us this morning, myself included, is are they? Are they increasing? Do they serve as signs? My prayer for us at Tomball Bible is that those qualities, those distinct, distinctives, distinctions, be a sign to the Lord, to each other, to the world around us, and to our own selves of God's faithfulness in us and through all generations.